Welcome in to another week of Yellow Jacket Football. I'm Kay Crenshaw, joined alongside Alan Head Coach Teddy Keaton. Coach, thanks for joining me again this week. I know it's been a little bit of a break for you with the bye last week. I know you spent some time with the family, also on the recruiting side of things for your assistant coaches. What was last week like? Last week was great. I think we got a lot of things done. We practiced a, a few days and made sure we worked out the kinks, you know, let a p few people healed up, got better. Um, install some different things that we've been trying to do and work on some areas that we felt we were deficient in. With Benedict coming up this weekend, obviously it's a big rivalry game, but it's also towards the end of the regular season, which as you like to say, there's going to be some nicks and bobos along the way. What's the injury report look like? We're doing well. I think everybody's back up and running. I think we got a lot of good treatment in. The hat goes off to the training room staff for getting everybody back up and ready for this game. I, I don't If a leg was broken in this game, I think somebody would try to duct tape it up to be able to play in the game. Here in November, it's always special when your opponent is still undefeated. That speaks to the incredible season that Coach Barry and Benedict have had. What do you attribute a lot of their success to? I think it's discipline. I think he's done a tremendous job. First of all, they deserve the success that they're having. When you watch tape on them, they're doing a really good job. I think Barry is a tremendous motivator, great coach. I think Odafer is doing a really good job with the defense. And my hat goes off to him. There's no envy there. I just feel like he's doing a great job and, and, and with that type of work. And we just want to get Allen University to that level too. What is your relationship like with Coach Barry? Because you've with him coming to Benedict and you coming to Allen, both in recent years, what's that relationship been like with you being just across the street? It's just, it's just a, 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 it's friendly. We don't, we don't have no run-ins. I mean, we're not best of friends or anything of that nature. Um, I didn't, I knew of Coach Barry. Coach Barry's coached with some people that I know. Um, but what every interactions I've had with Coach Barry has been nothing but friendly and great. I think he's a tremendous man of God. I think he works at the level that most people won't work at, and I think we both have the same goals to be successful. Uh, most people, when they consider to be a rival, most of us in the coaching era, it's not a rival between the coaches. It's just that game and that day. And we appreciate and we honor the fact that what he's doing at, at, at Benedict is tremendous. And I still feel in my eyes what we're doing at Allen is tremendous too. So it's going to be a great opportunity for, for, for both organizations to go out and have some success and give the fans something to talk about. It's a unique rivalry between the Yellow Jackets and the Tigers. For most schools, it's a couple hours spread apart. For the Yellow Jacket students, it's a couple feet right across the road from each other. For those who aren't here on campus every day, speak a little bit to what this rivalry means to the students as they can look across the street and see Benedict College. Again, I would say I don't know if the rival has taken the the, the, the taking on with the newer generation. The older people, they're really into it. The city, you know, this is the Soda City. They're ready for it. They're excited about the opportunity for both schools. Because back in the day, this was a, a, a vicious rival. They really believed. But for so long, Allen hadn't had football. They only had basketball. But you could tell during the game, it's a little bit. And at this, I think last year was the first time they played them in basketball in a long time as well. Um, and, but I love it. I think it's a great atmosphere, Bill. I think. But being that close, we actually practice on the side of the street that Benedict's on so it hadn't gotten to the point where it's a nasty bitter rival I think it's a mutual respect for all parties involved uh, we go there we play the game and we let the fans have the rival we just out there to entertain an assistant coach you've highlighted a lot this season has been your defensive line coach and EJ Jr. He's put out a tremendous product on the field with players like Kerry Thompson, even Richard Hayes making the transition from linebacker to D tackle or Tavon Edmond and Justin Eaton. You know, the list goes on. What did the addition of Coach Jr. mean to your staff? I mean, Coach Jr., I've been knowing him for a while. This is the second time I tried to hire him and I finally was able to land him. And I think he's done a great job with the kids he have. I think he's doing a good job of developing, not just as players, but as young men, um, but teaching them accountability. I mean, anytime you can be coached by a Hall of Famer, a guy that's played at the highest level, won national championships the whole nine, I think that's a tremendous honor for a young man to be able to be in that presence or in that space. We'll catch up with Coach Junior on the other side when we come back for more Yellow Jacket football.
We're back on Yellow Jacket Football. I'm Kate Crenshaw, now joined by Allen defensive line coach EJ Jr. Coach, your first appearance on the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, the 2022 season is slowly coming to a close. Just a pair of games left for your squad as you head into Benedict this week and look back on a lot of the successes this team has had in the regular season. What will you remember most? The effort that the kids gave throughout the season. They didn't quit. They have always fought through every adversity that they faced. There are times we could have, you know, won the game here or there. We lost four games by a total of 13 points. So when you see that in a team that's young, you know, very young, we only have eight to ten seniors on the team. These kids, kids kept fighting throughout the season. There were times we were down by 20 some points, came back and fought. So when you look at that, being, being a former head coach, that's growth. You know, the ship is turning, it might be turning slowly, but it's turning. And I think Coach Keaton has done a great job of what they're doing. The staff has been working hard and the kids are working even harder. Let's dive into your background and your career, and let's go all the way back to the beginning. Growing up there in Nashville, I have to ask, were you a country music fan growing up? No, I hated country music. Matter of fact, I used to work at the, uh, uh, the Grand Ole Opry. I would have my, my WVOL on my radio in my headset while I was listening to country music, but it was a job working at the Grand Ole Opry. It was fun. It was part of the discipline, but that's part of the culture, too, because when you look at the, the, the city and the music, it's not just country music, it's gospel music, it's rhythm and blues. So there are a lot of different mu musical histories that's going on in Nashville. They just got called, you know, country music city hall. So, so you go from working at the Grand Ole Opry, one legendary spot, to go playing under a legendary head coach at Alabama, Ender Bear Bryant. What was the recruiting process like when you <laughs> got the call and got the home visit from Coach Bryant that said, come be a member of the Crimson Tide? Well, that, that's the irony of it. I grew up in a time where there is a lot of uh, racial tension. Uh, the governor of Alabama back when I was eight years old was standing on the steps of the University of Alabama says a oh, black man will never walk on this campus. And that really turned me off at that time. So when I get the call from Coach Bryant, my mother answered the phone. Now, she's a retired principal. And you have to understand. There's a lot of respect for mothers, especially if they're a principal. So when, she, when he called, he says, may I speak to EJ Jr.? She says, which one? The third or Jr. Jr.? She says, the one I, that plays football. And he says, oh, he's right here. And she looked at me and I was doing my, my algebra homework. And she said, Coach Bryant wants to speak to you. I said, Bear Bryant? She said, yeah. I said, I don't want to talk to that man. She looked over her glasses and said, you're going to talk to this man. So I got on the phone. And I said, hello, Coach Bryant. He said, hello, EJ. I know you've heard some good things about Alabama. I've heard some bad things about Alabama. I'm going to promise you two things. I said, well, what is that, Coach? He says, well, if you come to Alabama, I guarantee you, you're going to get a quality education. And I'm going, Coach, I can get that anywhere. I said that to myself. I didn't say it out loud. I didn't want to get hit by my mom. He said, but the second thing, he said, if you come to Alabama, I'm going to work your tail off. And I paused. And the reason why I paused, because now you're challenging my work ethic. And I said, keep talking, coach. And the more and more I started listening to what he was trying to do, uh, he said his defensive coordinator, which was Ken Donahue, God rest his soul, was one of the greatest defensive coordinators I know. And I'm working with one now, LC Coach, who I really, really have a lot of respect for. And their, their recruiting style brought me to Alabama. I got a chance to see it when there was no bowl, no football game, no Bama Bells, no, and I saw for what it was. And I really felt that that's what I was purposed to be. And that was part of the decision-making process. So I ended up playing four years at Alabama, and the rest is history. And the history in that includes two national championships, a consensus first-team All-American nod, and an NFL draft choice. And you got lucky. There in 1981, it was just the second year they had televised the <laughs> NFL draft. So what was that moment like with you and your family when you got your name called fifth overall? Uh, it was it was very, very relieving. I knew I was going to go probably in the top ten. Uh, and I had a feeling I would go to St. Louis as many times as they flew me to St. Louis. Uh, but the thing was, it was just an honor just to get drafted. Uh, Sylvester Crew, who will be going to the College Football Hall of Fame this year, and hopefully I get a chance to make his ceremony, told me my senior year, he said, if you keep working as hard as you're working, you'll get a chance to be a number one draft choice. And I said, of what? And I'm thinking of the Army or, you know, some military. <laughs> so I was kind of oblivious to trying to play in the NFL because I never saw myself being that good. And he said, well, you play with Ozzie Newsom. You played with Tony Nathan, you played with Dwight Stevenson, Don McNeil, all these guys who were, you know, first or second round draft choice. He says, if you can play with them, don't you think you can play in the league? I'm like, maybe I can. So I've never been one who was like an individualist. I've always been a team player. So 
being a, being able to be that day with my parents, you know, was really really fun. It was exciting, but at the same time, I was just grateful to get a chance to get drafted. Thirteen years in the NFL, and then the accolades started to roll in. Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, and then the big one in 2020, the College Football Hall of Fame. I ask you, what was it like getting recruited by Barry Bryant? What was it like being a first-round draft choice? But finally, what was that <laughs> moment like when you found out your name will forever be enshrined in Atlanta? It was very humbling. And the way I found out was really ironic because I was sitting at home, you know, Coach Keaton has given me a chance to be a coach on his staff. But I'm sitting at home, basically working on a high school defensive coordinator player. There's a football that shows up, a box shows up in the mail, and it says EJ Jr. I, well, I have a son who's EJ Jr. the fourth. So I thought it was something that he ordered from Amazon. So, okay, let me get it. And I called him, I said, well, EJ, did you order this package from Amazon? He said, I haven't ordered anything, Dad. He said, it must be for you. So I open it up, and it's a football. And it says EJ Jr. the third. And I'm going, okay. It says December the 8th, 2021. I said, well, that's my birthday. So is this a birthday present? And I kept reading it, it says, Co College Football Hall of Fame. And I'm like, oh my God, I finally made it. Uh, being nominated for five straight years, uh, it was finally a relief to get in because it's never been about me. I played with guys for four years who were deserving of being in the College Football Hall of Fame. You know, I had teachers, I had coaches, I had uh, the, the cafeteria workers, the people who worked in that equipment, all were part of this. You know, we should have won three national championships. We got ripped off my freshman year when they jumped Notre Dame from fifth to first. But these are guys who worked their butts off. They taught me discipline, but they also taught me teamwork. And as part of that team, when you look at something like that, that kind of an honor for one person, it wasn't just about me. It was about those guys that I played with, those guys who, who had the blood, sweat, and tears. Some never got a chance to play on the field, but they practiced hard. You know, the guys who, who I always tried to be better than, wanted to be just as good as, and they're, they're part of this too. So when you think about Ozzie Newsom, you think about, you know, Terry Jones, who was an offensive lineman, who was a Hall of Famer in himself, moved to defense so Dwight Stevenson could be a Hall of Famer. We, we're talking about guys who sacrifice to be the best they could be, and I was just grateful to be a part of that team and those teams that Coach Bryant coached. We've talked about you playing at both the collegiate and professional levels. You also coached at both levels, starting in the NFL and then working your way back into college. What was the draw to get back into the collegiate game? Well, I've always wanted to teach college football. I, you know, I thought I, I had a chance to coach in the NFL. You're dealing with millionaires. You're dealing with guys who are making a lot of money, just more than you, and trying to teach them the game. But the one thing that kind of drove me was trying to teach what I learned. You know, from Ken Donahue, from, from Bill Oliver, from Jeff Rousey, you know, Paul Crane, Sylvester Croom to teach back to young men what was taught to me. And I always wanted to really work at an HBCU because I grew up in an HBCU family. My mother's a Spelman graduate, my dad's a Morehouse graduate, my sister and brother's a Morehouse and Spelman graduates. I'm the only white sheep of the family. So getting a chance to coach college football, I saw the discipline, maybe that was lacking a little bit, but they were sending out professional athletes long before I was going to Alabama. And I wanted to give back and hopefully get a chance to be a head coach. Uh, on that level, and I was granted that opportunity at Central State. I still have goals to be a head coach. Uh, was out of it for a little bit, and then Coach Keaton called me. We, we coached against each other. I kind of fussed at him a little bit when he, I didn't get the call the first time. And when I saw him hire the defensive coordinator, I called him and said, how come you didn't hire me to be your defensive coordinator? He says, well, I hired L.C. Cole. And I said, that's all. You don't have to say anything else because L.C. helped him become the head co uh, coach at uh, Stillman. And I know L.C. Coles from back in the days when he was at Tennessee State. So I had no qualms about it. I was just grateful to just be on his staff. He got me out of the house and working with a great group of guys, great group of kids, you know, fine administration. You know, there are things that could be different. But you know what? When you get an opportunity, you don't complain about it. You just work through it. You talk about getting out of the house, and you mentioned family a couple times. You're a father of eight children. What's it like inside those four walls? <laughs> ah... Hectic. But I mean, you know, I, the way I'm with my players, the way I am with my kids, they will tell you I have no favorites. You know, when you got seven boys and one girl and that girl is right dead in the middle, it, it's, it's like, oh, you know you got a favorite? I said, no, I don't have a favorite. I said, he said, well, you got to have one. I said, my favorite is the one who needs the help at the time. So the youngest now is a, a, a redshirt freshman at UC. He's struggling a little bit. But at the same time, he's 
I treat him the same way as I would treat any of my D linemen or the linebackers or anybody on the, on the Allen squad because of the fact that you got to work through adversity like everybody else. This world is not going to give anything to you. You have to earn it. And there are going to be problems. I could call Coach Fickle. We're good friends. I know who he is. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a parent to call me about their child about playing. No. They got to earn it just like everybody else. And nothing's given to you in this world. So everything you have to do is earn it. So being the last of the Mohicans, I'm happy now. The grandkids are driving me crazy. And I'm kind of glad to be away from them. That way I don't have to change diapers or chase after them. They get to chase, chase after me. So it's a, it's a blessing to be here. A college football Hall of Famer, national championship winning player, first round draft pick, maybe the toughest job seems to be grandpa. Oh yeah, the, the <laughs> grandpa is always the toughest job because they want to pull on your fingers and say, Papa, what do you want? Can I go there? No, 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 no. Go see your grandma. Uh, we call her Lele. So uh, it, it's a wonderful experience, but I've raised my kids. It's time for my kids to raise their kids. I, I, I sit back and kind of be neutral on everything. To some, he's Papa. <laughs> to hear Allen, he's Coach Junior, defensive line coach for the Yellow Jackets. We'll be back for more on the other side when we return to Yellow Jacket football. Back with Coach Eaton. Coach, like you said, Coach Junior, a three-time Hall of Famer. The Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, Tennessee Hall of Fame, College Football Hall of Famer. With having a guy with so many accolades and your players a male role model to look up to, what does he mean to have that on your staff as a player who's been there and done that? I think it's for this generation um, to know his accomplishments and what he's done. I think that's a tremendous space for somebody to be in. I mean. I'm always a guy that's, I'm an impressionable guy. Anybody that can add value to me, I want them around me. If anybody that can't add value to me, I don't want you near me. Um, I think he brings the energy, the work ethic. I aspire to be at this level. If I aspire to be at this level, who else to teach you how to get to that level than an EJ Jr.? Those guys that have been there, they've seen it. They can show them examples. And if you take in what they're teaching, I think it could help your career. We all know that everybody's not going to get to that level, but at least you got an expiring or a goal, and there's the blueprint right here in front of you. He can show you how to get there or help you develop your game, whether it be mentally, physically, or spiritually, because most people don't know EJ is a man of God. He sends us these texts in the morning time to get our day started, and you know we read them every day, and hopefully we can find something to inspire us, and then we turn around, and one day he doesn't send it, Everybody on the coaching staff jumps on him because he didn't send out the text, so he got a little behind on his day. But we in, we appreciate that because he's speaking to us spiritually, help guiding us. I think he has the biggest pulpit in America. I say football has been a place where you can save men. You can, I mean, you got a hundred kids out there that you can touch their life. If he only touched one of them, he's done his job here on this earth. Well, we turn our attention to this Saturday's opponent, the Benedict Tigers, a one o'clock kickoff. Down in Blythewood, Coach, an undefeated Tigers team. They're viewed as one of the top teams in HBCU football this season. What will be the biggest test they will give you? I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to clarify something. They're not just the top team in HB, HBCU football. In regional, Super Region number two, they're the number two team in Super Regional two in the country. They're number nine team in D2 in the country. So this is the second time we've taken on an opponent of this magnitude, which is great for our program. Um, my, like I said, again, my hat goes off. I've watched a lot of film on these guys. They've done a tremendous job. They're where they're supposed to be. They execute at a high level. We're going to have to play really, really good football. Um, I want to, I don't want to take anything from my team. I think we've done a tremendous job, but we got to eliminate the mistakes. We can't give them extra possessions. They've made a living off of, you know, the possibilities of making you create turnovers and they create turnovers and they take them and turn them into points. Um, so if we can do a good job of taking care of the ball, executing at a high level and doing the things that we're supposed to do, I think we'll have a chance to play good football with them. The Yellow Jackets will take on the Tigers in the matchup of Harden Street 
this Saturday, a 1 o'clock kick, and just maybe Allen can spoil the undefeated season of the SIAC East champs. For Teddy Keaton, I'm Kate Crenshaw. This has been Yellow Jacket Football. We'll see you next time.